Madam President, uh, my colleagues, uh, my colleague from Tennessee was just talking about priorities of this administration and this Senate. And I want to continue on that area of focus relating to what many of us believe is probably the most important priority we have in the United States Senate, and that's defending our nation. Madam President, budgets are a reflection of an administration's values and an administration's priorities. And as I mentioned, many of us, and I believe on both sides of the aisle, see that the number one priority we should have in the United States Senate is making sure we are a strong nation to defend this great country of ours and to make sure we have the most lethal, well-trained military anywhere in the world. And we take care of our troops and their families. But this is not what this administration, the Biden administration, believes at all. In fact, President Biden's budgets clearly not only do not prioritize our military, they put them consistently last. And that's not a one-time thing. This is a pattern with this administration. Madam President, here was the President's proposed budget last year. Take a look at it. We all know it was trillions and trillions. Department of Commerce, 28% increase. EPA, 21%. Interior, 16%. On and on, double-digit increases everywhere, except, except the two agencies that actually protect the nation, Department of Defense and Department of Homeland Security. Last year, the Biden budget put forward a budget that, if it was adjusted for inflation, was almost a 3% cut to the Department of Defense. Priorities matter. This administration has not prioritized our military at all. Guess who was really pleased by that budget, by the way? The dictator in Beijing and the dictator in Moscow. No doubt when they saw that, they loved it. Thankfully, Madam President, the Armed Services Committee, on which I sit, said, you know what, Mr. President, with all due respect, this is nuts. We're not going to stand for this. We put forward in the National Defense Authorization Act last year a 3% real increase to the Department of Defense budget. Very bipartisan in the committee, a complete rebuke to the President of the United States, saying, we don't believe in cuts, we're going to increase. The appropriators, thankfully, did the same. So that was the Biden administration's prioritization of our military last year. Now, what happened between last year and this year when the most recent budget came out? Well, I think a lot of us know, Madam President, but I'm going to talk a little bit about it. Russia invaded Ukraine. In an April Armed Services hearing, the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, said that the invasion was, quote, the greatest threat to peace and security of Europe and perhaps the world in any of my time of 42 years in uniform. So this is the chairman of the Armed Services Committee saying we are likely seeing one of the most dangerous periods anywhere in the world in terms of national security in the last four decades. That was testimony from the president's own chairman of the Armed Services Committee. That's Russia and of course their ally, China, is also taking incredibly aggressive actions all around the world. They're beginning to outcompete our country on many fronts, critical minerals, energy, technology. Certainly, Xi Jinping, the dictator of Beijing, has increased China's aggression all around the world. India threatening to invade Taiwan, economic aggression towards Australia, snuffing out liberty in Hong Kong. What else has China done? It is dramatically increasing its defense spending, more than 7% this year, 
increasing a navy that is almost becoming larger than ours. This is how General Milley again put it in a hearing last April. Quote, we are now facing two global powers, China and Russia, each with significant military capabilities, both of whom intend to fundamentally change the current rules-based global order. We are entering a world that is becoming more unstable, and the potential for significant international conflict between great powers is increasing, not decreasing. So that is the chairman of the Armed Services Committee again. Now, what do you think the president did seeing we have this incredibly dangerous period internationally with his next budget? Last year, as I mentioned, he cut the, Pe the Pentagon defense budget by almost 3%. Dead last with Homeland Security in terms of agencies. So, did he listen to his chairman? Does he really think it's that dangerous? Let's see. This is, Madam President, this is this year's defense budget and other priorities from this administration's multi trillion dollar budget. And once again, you see the EPA coming in at a 24% increase, commerce, HHS, labor, all double digits, interior, DOJ. What about the Department of Defense? 4% increase with almost 9% inflation. We're talking close to a 5% real cut to the Department of Defense. Madam President, this is outrageous. Last year, the president put forward almost a 4% cut to defense spending. In the interim period, we have one of the most dangerous wars that's happened, certainly in Europe and maybe in the world, in a generation. The president's own secretary of defense and chairman of the armed services comes before the Senate Armed Services Committee and says, it's an incredibly dangerous time, a period maybe since Almost in 50 years, we haven't seen so many threats to the international order. And the president does what? He once again prioritizes our defense almost dead last. Almost dead last. Adjusted for inflation, a 5% cut. Now, at this posture hearing for the Secretary of Defense and Chairman Milley, I asked the question, Gentlemen, with all due respect, you just said it's the most dangerous period in almost the last 50 years. How can you come before this committee and put forward a budget that's almost a 5% cut to the Department of Defense and our troops? Madam President, they didn't have a good answer. The truth of the matter is, I'm quite certain that the uniform military and probably even Secretary Austin do not support this budget. But they're good soldiers. They had to salute the commander in chief and try to support it. But we don't have to support it. And I know the American people certainly don't support it. But once again, I do know two people who support it. Vladimir Putin, Xi Jinping, look at this and this is something they're very pleased with. So Madam President, once again, the Armed Services Committee, when we met to mark up the NDAA, we voted in an overwhelming bipartisan fashion, 23 to three, to once again dramatically rebuke the president in a bipartisan way and significantly increase the top line for the Department of Defense to make sure we have a strong nation and that our troops are taken care of, and so are their families, by almost $45 billion over what the president requested. Bipartisan rebuke, once again, by this administration that won't prioritize our national security and keeps putting forward budgets that prioritize the defense of our nation last. Madam President, we also started in this NDAA to course correct, 
which we need dramatically at the Pentagon. We have had civilian leadership, primarily driven by the Biden administration's far left nominees, who have not been focusing the Pentagon on its top priority, which is to win our nation's wars and to make sure we have the most lethal military of any country in the world. So I was able in this NDAA to put forward some amendments that I was glad to get bipartisan support on that are in the current NDAA that start a course correction. First, Madam President, one of my amendments directed the Pentagon to discontinue any further investment in the DOD-wide effort to root out so-called extremism within the ranks. This has been an obsession of the civilian leadership at the Pentagon, many of whom know nothing about the military. It's an obsession given the incredibly low rate of extremist activity in our military, as determined by the Secretary of Defense's own working group on this topic. The press didn't write about that because they love to kind of weave the story that somehow our military is full of extremists. Unfortunately, some of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle play that up too. One senator at one point said 10% of the military might be extremists, a ridiculous besmirching of the men and women in our armed services. The actual report from the Secretary of Defense's office found fewer than 100 cases of extremism activity in a total military force of over 2 million people. You do the math, that's less than 0.005%. So let me be clear, extremism has no place in our military and must be rooted out when discovered, but these numbers simply don't warrant the time and investment that our senior military has put in to this issue. And in the NDAA, we have said we're not funding it anymore. The second issue, Madam President, that is in the NDAA that I was able to put forward an amendment to, the Department of the Army and the Department of the Air Force, according to press reports, were starting to devise a policy that would allow each service member to veto their duty assignment if they disagree with the laws and regulations in a state or community where they were gonna be assigned by the military. Could you imagine the chaos that would result if every soldier, marine, or sailor, or airman could say, you know, I don't want to go to California. Its regulations on the Second Amendment are overly burdensome on my Second Amendment right, or any other reason. So we put in the NDAA a policy that gives servicemen and women the ability to veto their assignment based on whether they want to go somewhere or not, is not the way our military is going to operate. That's been nipped in the bud. And finally, a very simple amendment that I put forward that just provides clarity to the men and women of the Department of Defense. All it does is reminds them of what their job is. Madam President, the military is too often asked to do so many different things, focus on climate change, focus on so many other issues. The military has one job, to provide combat credible military forces needed to deter our adversaries, protect the security of our nation, and win our nation's wars when called upon to do so. So I put forward an amendment that said just that. Here's your priority. Here's what you're supposed to do. And it's needed because of all the things that our top civilian leaders are now telling the troops they should be focused on. They should be focused on prevailing in a war if they are called to do so. And that's what my amendment did. Believe it or not, a number of senators voted against it, but that also made the Defense Authorization Act this year. So in addition to significantly increasing the Department of Defense's authorized budget, we are starting to 
once again get the military focused on their primary job, lethality and winning wars. So we need to bring the NDAA to the floor. We passed it 66 years in a row. As I mentioned, the administration's priorities are clearly not with regard to national defense and our military. We can tell by the budget that's been put forward. In the Senate, priorities are often determined by time on the floor to get a piece of legislation moving. And Madam President, it is clear to everybody who's been here that the majority leader does not prioritize the military the same way the President of the United States does it. We passed the NDAA in June, the Armed Services Committee did, in a huge bipartisan vote. The House passed its NDAA in the House in July. So we are waiting to bring up one of the most important pieces of legislation we work on every year, the legislation that sets the policy and funds our troops and their families. Where is it? Senator Schumer, where is it? When are we going to bring it up? You have Democrats and Republicans who are looking at this floor time in September saying, we need to bring up the NDAA. The rumor is right now that the majority leader plans to bring it up in December. Think about that, America. I don't even know what we're doing right now on the Senate floor. Minor nominations. We should be bringing up the NDAA to protect this country and to make sure the men and women in our military know we have their back. But right now, nobody has any idea, maybe this majority leader does, on when we're actually going to bring this most important bipartisan piece of legislation to the floor. So Madam President, this is why I joined a letter that we sent out today, led by Senator Tuberville, who serves on the Armed Services Committee with me, signed by 20 of my colleagues. And by the way, I know it would be signed by some Democrat colleagues as well. They didn't want to put their name on the letter, but they feel the same. That says to the majority leader, you control the Senate. You control the priority of this body. Bring up the NDAA by the end of September. Here's the letter, Madam President. I'd like to submit it for the record. The letter says that, quote, at the founding of our nation, then General George Washington penned, quote, when the civil and military powers cooperate and afford mutual aid to each other, there can be little doubt of things going well. As General Milley said, one of the most dangerous times, at one of the most dangerous times in recent history, it is vital that our civil and military powers cooperate. What we need to do in this body right now is get back to the important work of bolstering our economy, fighting inflation, bringing down energy costs, unleashing American energy, and most importantly, Madam President, passing the NDAA so we can bolster the national security of this great nation in very dangerous times. I call on the majority leader, along with 20 of my colleagues and some of my Democratic colleagues, to bring the NDAA to the floor, not wait till the end of the year, which is what we hear you are planning to do. I yield the floor.